Hey everyone, this is Riven Blade with a review of AEW Dynamite for June 30th, 2021. So this is the last show taking place at Daly's Place in Jacksonville during the pandemic era before AEW goes back on the road. And uh, you know what? It just feels right to have AEW back on Wednesdays. And they really went out with a bang here. And this was really the end of an era, the pandemic era. I'm going to remember a lot of things from this time over the past 16 months. And uh, I'm glad that AEW was able to go out on this era on a high note. So let's start things off with Chris Jericho coming to the commentary booth. He's got these kicks on. Look, they look very thick. Very comfortable, and he's going to need those later on when he gets pushed off the stage by Wardlow, and uh, those probably helped him not to roll an ankle or anything like that. And uh, Jim Ross, you know, he had a couple of interesting bookends to, you know, <laughs> cover this show from the beginning to end. Uh, as Jericho's making his way to the announce team, you see a sign saying Jim Ross is a national treasure, and uh, we'll get back to him. You probably know what happened there already. First match, we got the tag team eliminator match between Penta El Zero Miedo and Eddie Kingston taking on these dirt bags, the Young Bucks. So these guys just look like scum with their porn stashes. Uh, and you know what? It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's great. It suits them so, so well. This match was a banger. It was a lot of fun. So you had double team maneuvers, you had taunting, you had high flying maneuvers, you had Eddie Kingston hitting a fisherman suplex, basically hitting a perfect plex, which is pretty awesome. Uh, you had some nice camera angles. Uh, you had facial expressions. I mean, Eddie's got such a unique face and such unique expressions. And uh, of course, the Young Bucks selling in pain in tears is always a sight to behold. Anyway, uh, this whole match ends when Brandon Cutler is supposed to spray Penta El Zero Miedo in the face with the cold spray while uh, Anderson and Gallows are distracting the ref. But Penta ducks and he sprays Matt. And he's just so shocked by what he's done, he just can't stop doing it. So he keeps doing it. And it was just a really funny slapstick comedy moment. I loved it. And uh, yeah, just really funny thing. Uh, there he is taken out by Kazarian who comes in to save the day and the fear factor is hit by Penta and one, two, three. Hey, Eddie's shocked. Penta's happy. Uh, Kazarian's looking on and this was the Young Bucks first tag team loss in quite a while, around a year ago actually. And uh, it felt big. The crowd was into it. It was a heck of a lot of fun. They saved some stuff for the next match when they actually have to challenge for the titles next week on Road Rager. But overall, this is this is the type of stuff I love from AEW. I thought all of the stuff in the post-match was done really well. And I just had a, a lot of fun watching this tag match to start the show. Put a big grin on my face. Uh, next up, we have Christian talking to Jungle Boy before he gets interrupted by the rest of the Jurassic Express. He tells Luchasaurus that, you know, he is, uh, I believe, a quarter Triceratops on his mom's side. And uh, any friend of Jungle Boy's is a friend of Luchasaurus's. So they go off and they chat. Um, Christian is really giving off these kind of pseudo heel vibes right now. Like he's been being a little bit condescending, I find, to Jungle Boy with kind of like the patting of the head. Uh, so Uncle Christian, I like this role for him. I think we do end up with Christian versus Jungle Boy at some point, so uh, that's going to be fun to see whenever that happens, if it happens. Next up, we got Ethan Page in the ring, and he talks about the upcoming casket match with Darby Allen, and uh, he says he is going to exterminate him. So literally, he wants to just end this man's not only career, but his life, maybe. Anyway... Uh, Sting comes out, and he is carrying a casket. We get a quick video, one of Darby's black and white things, where he puts Ethan Page's face over his face. He's burning a coffin somewhere out in a field, and he is inside the coffin. He runs, attacks Ethan Page. Um, Sting does a scorpion death drop on Scorpio Sky, and then Darby, with these long nails, just digs them into Ethan Page's eyes, who says, my eyes, my eyes. Uh, the camera did a good job of catching that moment. And Page is just so annoyed by this, he puts off the match. He says, you know what, Darby, forget it. 
We were supposed to have this match next week in Miami at Road Rager, but if you can keep your hands off me for a week, maybe we can do this at Fighter Fest. Uh, now, I've seen the reason for this pushback of the match because this did feel like a strange angle. Normally, when AEW advertises something, they deliver on it. Um, so, uh, obviously, this this didn't feel like a bait and switch to me when you found out that uh, Miami recently had a tragedy and having a, a coffin match, you know, just the week after a tragedy was not going to be good form. So, kind of good on AEW for pushing it back for uh, very human reasons. And... Yeah, so next up we had Kenny Omega. Uh, so there was a re recap of the amazing match that he had with Jungle Boy. And then we had um, Matt Hardy coming in, with, sorry, giving a pre-match promo as Jack Evans was making his way to the ring against Jungle Boy. So yeah, this is Jungle Boy versus Jack Evans. That's what I meant to say. And uh, this was a pretty, well, kind of like a nothing match. It was there. It was competently worked. Um, but it wasn't really so much there for anything other than Jungle Boy getting his 50th win in AEW. And the uh, the announced team sold it as a really big deal. So that kind of helped to put him over. And uh, yeah, this one, you know, it had the usual kind of stuff that you'd expect from a Jungle Boy match, from a Jack Evans match. Uh, in the beginning, they were kind of dodging each other's moves and kind of holding on to the ropes. So the other guy would like miss a drop kick or something like that. And uh, in the end, Jungle Boy picks up the victory. One, two, three. Looking strong. Good way to kind of just regain a little bit of the fire after losing to Kenny last week, despite having a fantastic match against him. And gets his 50th win in AEW, the first one to be to do that on the roster. Uh, and after the match, there is a post-match attack. But before Jungle Boy can get into too much trouble, Christian comes to the rescue cleans house, takes out Matt Hardy. So we're building towards Hardy and Christian still. You can see he chokes him out a little bit. Hardy's none too pleased on the ramp. And you know what? Hardy didn't look too comfortable in the ring um, when he was in there with Christian. I thought they looked a little bit awkward together, more so a Hardy than Christian. Um, I'm curious to see what they can do together in 2021. Uh, but at the same time, you know, this Hardy family office stuff, I'm Still a fan of what Matt Hardy has been doing overall, uh, but I thought this stuff kind of peaked with the big money match against Hangman. So, um, you know, unless they bring in Jorah Joel to Dynamite, I'm not sure where this is going to go. So, yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh, next up, pretty fire promo from MJF, just hyping up the match against Sammy Guevara. And he's just, oh, man, he goes through so many emotions here <laughs> um, that it's just impossible not to like this guy. Uh, next, probably my second favorite promo of the show, uh, we had Andrade, and he talks about, you know, his big surprise being interrupted because of Matt, Matt's what? Matt something. So he sets up a match next week for Road Rager. He says Andrade El Idolo versus Matt something. So Seidel versus Andrade happening next week. Andrade's debut match in AEW. Really looking forward to seeing him there. Uh, next, Kenny comes to the ring. He's sporting mutton chops while the Bucks were sporting those porn stashes. And, oh man, just dirt bag city. These guys look like scum and I love it. Kind of got that, got that like Triple H look going for them. This was a fantastic promo by Kenny Omega. Talks about how there are no more challengers left for him in AEW. He's going to take a break. He's going to defend his other belts around the world. The Dark Order come out and say, actually, you know what? There is someone. He's like, well, who's it going to be? There were a couple of nice little um, hypocritical moments from Kenny here. So he's, he says, who, you know, who, which one of you is going to take me on five? He couldn't go two minutes with me. Of course, five had that match where he went like six to 10 minutes with Kenny Omega and kind of like blew up Twitter a little bit saying, you know, Alan Angel shouldn't be going with Kenny Omega that long. Uh, so that was pretty funny. And then he calls the Dark Order a bunch of like gamer goober geeks or something like that. Uh, and of course, Kenny himself is obviously a massive nerd and is working on the AEW console game. So uh, pot calling the kettle black on that one. And I really loved the intensity of Kenny. Obviously, they're talking about Hangman Page, that there is someone ready. And Kenny, he kind of ups the ante, ups the intensity each time he says, if you think if, if you're talking about who I think you're talking about, and he says, Hangman, 
isn't ready, that Hangman doesn't want this title, um, and he doesn't even think that he deserves it. He doesn't have the guts to take the title from Kenny. So uh, just a really, really great performance from Kenny Omega. Everything from the presentation, like the clothes he's wearing, to this the mutton chops, which in this image it looks like it was kind of like sprayed on or something. Anyway, um, just a fabulous fabulous promo performance and i cannot wait to see what they do to build up this program in the coming months as they probably are going to face off each other against each other at all out so looking forward to that uh just again perfect promo uh then we got brian pillman jr just kind of setting up the the match with him and miro which is next uh this was basically a match in three acts so the beginning had Miro just tossing Pillman around inside and outside the ring. And then Pillman saw a little bit of light. He kind of, you know, snapped Miro's neck on the top rope, got in a string of offense. And, um, you know, he got even he managed to hit his his finisher, which if you've been watching him on Dark and Elevation, uh, you know that the finisher he's been using lately is the um, top rope springboard clothesline that he does. And Miro kicked out at one. <laughs> now, I think obviously those in the in the announce booth, they didn't sell this as like a huge deal. It was just like, oh, Miro kicked out. Um, I think they just probably don't watch Elevation or Dark, even though Tony's on one of those shows. So uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, I thought it was funny that kind of the announce team didn't kind of, you know, sell that as a bigger deal. But that was basically, you know, Pillman Jr.'s one thing that he had in this match. Uh, wasn't really even a close call. You never thought that he really had a chance. And then the third act was just Miro going back to dominating, uh, just grabbing his leg and giving him a kick to the face and then putting on the game over. And there is this little bit of a moment where it looks like Pillman Jr. might be able to survive it. But in the end, Miro puts him all the way back and Pillman goes out. So he doesn't tap out. It keeps him looking a little bit strong. And again, I'm still enjoying Pillman Jr. as this white meat baby face. And I love Miro's character right now. So at the end of the match, he holds the title belt up towards the heavens, looking up. And it looks like he almost has tears in his eyes. Just this golden offering to his god. <laughs> uh, he also has new entrance music, which starts off with like a horn, which makes it sound like Godzilla's on his way to rampage through the city. Um, and then kind of this uh, epic orchestral music that comes in that reminds me of, uh, if you know the band Two Steps From Hell, if you don't look up Two Steps From Hell on YouTube, uh, just phenomenal orchestral instrumental music, uh, beautiful stuff. And that's kind of what this theme reminds me of. And I'm looking forward to, you know, actually hearing the MP3 or the uh, it on YouTube. All right. Uh, next up, we go to the back with Marvez. He is with the Dark Order, and they are confronted by Adam Page, who is none too happy that they spoke on his behalf. And this segment made me tear up, honestly. Like, he has such good and supportive friends. It was really sweet to see. Uh, they said, you know, do you think I'm, he said, do you think I'm scared of Kenny? He's like, no, you're not scared, but we think you might be scared of failure. It's okay to fail. We'll be here to catch you if you do. And these guys are just really sweet. I just, I love this whole thing. I love this Hangman story. And I can't wait to see what they do next. And uh, with Kenny being from North Carolina, um, I think they're going to probably have him challenge Kenny at that show uh, later on. I think that's in July or August that they're in there. Okay. Uh, uh, Fight for the Fallen. Yes, at Fight for the Fallen at the end of July. Uh, next up, Hook, Hobbs, and Taz in the back. Uh, obviously, they are aware that there are problems between Ricky Starks and Brian Cage. And you know what? They're going to settle them. So Ricky Starks and Brian Cage are going to have a match on July 14th at Fighter Fest to settle their differences. Now, I'm wondering if we're going to get a swerve here and if it's actually going to be uh, Ricky Starks who turns face and leaves Team Taz that would be pretty surprising given the, you know, Taz, Taz has been on commentary a lot for this this whole buildup between Cage and Starks, and he's been really pissed off at the decisions that Cage has been making. But if they wanted to swerve us, 
I think they could still make sense of it and make it work, and I think it would be pretty cool. Um, Brian Cage, though, I mean, he's a great babyface too, so whether Cage uh, continues on the babyface path with the FTW belt or if Ricky Starks takes it from him or loses and ends up being a babyface, I think they got options here, uh, although the thing that makes the most sense really is Cage leaving, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, next up, the one real downside of the show uh, okay, so first of all, the positives. I liked the matching gear as they entered the ring. Nyla and Vicky wearing the masks, um, wearing the headdress. It looked cool, and it showed them, you know, as a unit. So that was kind of neat. And then we had Britt Baker coming out with Rebel. So this is a tag match, which Vicky asked for. And I was waiting for the swerve. I was waiting for Vicky to say, nope, can't go. Or I was waiting for... Brit or Rebel to injure her right at the beginning of the match, so she has to be swapped out with someone else. But no, they put Vicky Guerrero in a wrestling match in 2021, and Rebel as well. Um, the story of the match was okay. Uh, you had Brit, who <laughs> you can see Nyla, like she's really like just teed off here, and uh, Brit doesn't want to face her, so she kind of forces Rebel to start the match. And Rebel jumps on Nyla's back and kind of, you know, wrestles with her a bit before Nyla takes over, of course. And, you know, anytime or one time that Rebel tries tagging Brit in, Brit says, nah, you got it. This is all on you. You're you're on top of this. Uh, eventually, Vicky gets in there. She shakes her thing a little bit. And this match ends with Vicky taking the lockjaw, which she does only sold for about like five seconds after it was taken off her and the match was stopped. She kind of just like got to her knees and got up like way too quickly after the match, I thought. This, okay, one good thing about this thing. The two good things. So first, the matching gear for Nyla and Vicky. The second thing is the post-match. The power bomb through the table looked really good. Uh, so I will say that. Now, what are they doing with this? Um, is Britta face here? I mean, I still think she's a heel. She lost to Sheeta, who, by the way, we haven't seen. Sorry, she beat Sheeta, and Sheeta we still haven't seen since that match at um, at Double or Nothing on Dynamite. Yes, she's been wrestling on Elevation, but we all know that this is the premier show. Uh, we have a heel versus heel match, and I don't know who to cheer for, really. Like, I don't want Nyla to win. I don't really want Brit to win because I want to dislike Brit. Uh, I think she's kind of probably a tweener at this point. That's the really the only way I can view her as. But I'm just not feeling what they're doing right now with this storyline. Uh, and I hope the match itself is still going to be really good. Um, I hope they surprise everybody. And I hope that whoever Brit faces next is done and set up a lot better and has a clearer face heel dynamic than what they're doing right now with Nyla. This is such a weird, weird thing that they're doing right now in the women's division. And uh, you know what? Once Rampage starts up, I really, really hope, I really hope that they get this stuff in order. I mean, you've got Yuka Sakazaki, you've got Riho, you've got Red Velvet, you've got Jade, you've got Ty Conti, you've got Penelope Ford, you have got a roster of women, you've got Thunder Rosa, you have a roster of women who are talented, who can do stuff, who can make you know compelling television and have proven that they can make compelling television. So please, please treat them with the same respect that you treat the men. Uh, that's, that's all I ask moving forward. All right, so Road Rager next week. We got a stacked show for AEW's first show back on the road. Uh, we got Young Bucks taking on Penta El Zero Miedo and Eddie Kingston, this time for the AEW Tag Team Championships. Uh, Cody Rhodes and QT Marshall in that South Beach strap match. Andrade El Idolo versus Matt Seidel in what I hope and what is almost certain to be like just a fantastic match. I'm so psyched for this one. Uh, inner Circle, Jake Hager, Santana and Ortiz with Conan taking on the Pinnacle, Wardlow and FTR with Tully Blanchard. Uh, so this is kind of a preview of Santana and Ortiz versus FTR, but this time in a, in a six-man tag. Uh, so curious about this one, and just to see Santana and Ortiz taking on FTR in the ring is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, speaking of those guys, they cut a really strong promo where Jake Hager actually sounds quite strong, quite convincing, quite pissed off. I was very surprised. 
Uh, but this is good stuff going into their match next week. Also next week, face-to-face standoff between Chris Jericho and MJF and eh, AEW history being made. The first ever mixed tag team match. Chris Statlander and Orange Cassidy taking on the Bunny and the Blade. Now, don't get your hopes up. This is not true intergender wrestling. A mixed tag match means that the women must face off against the women. The men must face off against the men, uh, unless AEW is putting their own spin on the formula. Um, but again, this I liked the the highlight that they're giving to the spotlight that they're giving to Chris Statlander right now. But unfortunately, it still seems like she's being used as a way to further this storyline between Orange Cassidy and The Blade. And I just want to see more than one women's match per week, guys. Like, just, I don't know. Just please make it happen. All right, main event time. Whew. Well, I liked last week's main event, I think, a little bit more than this one. Uh, This was still a banger. MJF versus Sammy Guevara. And just to set the stage here... Like, imagine and think back to October 2019. Okay, you couldn't imagine an opening segment, a middle, top of the hour segment, or a closing segment not involving either Cody, John Moxley, Chris Jericho, or Kenny Omega. Like, one of those four guys was always either the beginning of the show, the middle of the show, or the end of the show. And there were those complaints about, oh, AEW is relying on former WWE guys and they can't rely on their own talent. Well, here we are. We have a main event where I didn't even think twice about, you know, Cody not being there or Mox not being there. Of course, they have reasons for being on paternity leave and Cody was there, but whatever. Anyway, you know what I mean? (laughs) Um, We are here where AEW's young talent has begun to thrive and that they're ready to take on the mantle. And these kind of matches, you know, in these early years of the promotion are going to go a long way to setting these guys up for success in the future. I've loved this booking and I just I love that AEW knows what they have in these guys and that they've put them in these big time positions where people's eyes are on them wanting them to succeed and rooting for them to succeed and they have the talent and as this match shows they they definitely can deliver in the ring um so we start off with some chain wrestling and them mocking each other the strutting uh just escapes and spinning around and and near pinfalls and things like this so just showing that they can wrestle I didn't think that this was as fast and as quick as like MJF and Jungle Boy. I thought they had better chemistry, but uh, overall it was still pretty fun. Eventually they went to the outside and uh, this is where the match started getting like really wild in the second half. So MJF is over the guardrail. Sammy just hurls himself over there, uh, knocking over MJF. It was just an incredible spot. Um, MJF caught him quite well, actually, so I don't think they could have done that almost any better. Um, Sammy's obviously feeling it, and the spot that kind of annoyed a lot of people, and I thought the match was over over here, too. Uh, we had a second rope tombstone pile driver from MJF on Sammy Guevara. Boom. Just absolutely incredible stuff, um, really thrilling stuff, where almost anything can go wrong here. But luckily, it didn't, and uh, the guys were okay. But after this spot, yeah, that fan is just like, wow, what is going on here? They laid on the ground for quite a while. MJF sold his knee for quite a while. Uh, I thought that just Sammy's arm was legit messed up, and I thought that maybe MJF's... Oh, I, I don't know. I thought that MJF was selling his knee like for the purposes of the story, but the way Sammy was kind of holding his arm at his side with after taking the move, I thought for sure that something had gone wrong, especially with the guys laying on the mat for like two minutes, three minutes after this. So really good selling, and uh, they got me. They got me here. Anyway, uh, eventually Sammy gains back some momentum, and uh, he hits the the go to hell, the GTH, and he just can't believe it. That, (laughs) again, MJF kicks out at two, and uh, eventually he goes up for the 630, MJF saying, no, no, please don't do it, and Sammy does it, and MJF still kicks out. So that, again, just really unbelievable stuff over here. Uh, Eventually, you got Sean Spears coming out. We got Ward, though, who cuts off Chris Jericho before he can get to Spears. 
and uh, tosses him off the stage at the back there while distracting the ref. And uh, he tells the ref, hey, look over here, look over here. And that allows Spears the opportunity to just slam Sammy in the head with the chair. He got his hands up in time, luckily. And this look of euphoria on Spears' face was just incredible. I really like this character touch from Spears. And uh, MJF just rolls over one arm. One, two, three. MJF defeats Sammy Guevara in the main event of the final episode of the pandemic era at Daly's Place in Jacksonville of AEW Dynamite. That is a long sentence. And this isn't uh, the last thing we see tonight. By the way, great main event. Definitely go out of your way to see it. These guys just went all out. They, They really did. And we get this tribute video just looking back on everything that has happened in the pandemic era. And it was just beautiful. I teared up. Uh, I've watched it two or three times this morning as well. And you know what? This is a time in AEW history that I definitely won't forget. This is the time in history that really made me a huge fan of the promotion. Despite all of the challenges, um, all of the obstacles that were in their way, they still managed to put together some amazing quality television. And uh, I'll never forget it. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's the, the side the. <laughs> That's the thing that made me tear up. And we end with a shot of the fans, which is appropriate. Uh, these people have been here, you know, since uh, Daly's Place has started letting fans in a little bit. And you know what? I'm looking forward to seeing what AEW does next. This show was just a home run for me. And uh, I'm sorry if I sound a little tired because I definitely am. It's after midnight. <laughs> it's been a busy day. Uh, but if you made it this far, just know that I appreciate you. And please, if you like this video, uh, don't forget to give me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications, and uh, leave a comment. Let me know what I can do better in the future. Uh, Let me know what you'd like to see, what I'm doing right, and uh, I'd really appreciate that. So until next time, take care and take it easy.